Before or after you watch this video, check out the links in the description below for other goodies and updates. Also click on the bell right next to the subscribe button to get notifications on my new videos. So I've been interested in this story for a long time because unlike other lost episode creepypastas, this one has kind of a lot of weight to it. You know, to an extent. I mean, there's obviously no person that was uh, with Seth during Season 8 to uh, make all this happen. But, uh, let's face it, with Season 8 of Family Guy and upwards, it seems like it's just gotten more violent and more aggressive and really far from what it used to be. You know, where it was pushing the envelope, but it wasn't going too far that kids probably couldn't watch. I have to say, I'm pretty impressed with this story because it's pretty tame. It doesn't go too far. It doesn't have any of the cliches that you would expect. I really enjoy it for what it is. I wish more uh, Lost Episode posters like this because, you know, after all the bloodshed and gore you usually get from Lost Episode, pastas you just kind of need something that seems semi-realistic and this is definitely one of the stories that i would recommend to anyone who's interested in lost episode pastas i will not say who i am i will not say what position i held that allow me to be aware of the information i'm about to share suffice to say I don't hold it anymore. I have read some of the letters directed at Seth and Fox complaining about Season 8 of Family Guy. And while I can't officially make these statements to any press, I don't want to stay quiet anymore. Many people feel that Season 8 was just off in an odd sort of way. For one who took note of Season 8 of Family Guy for the specific reason of elevated graphic violence, I wanted to say this. Seth MacFarlane was going through a lot during the times these episodes were written and produced. He was heavily involved in writing the episodes alongside series writers, several of which made comments later regarding his apparent state of mind during writing sessions. However, more recently, when looking for corroborators, my ex-co-workers denied Seth being involved as he was, as well as Steve, whom I'll explain in a bit. A number of scenes did generate a certain amount of negative viewer response. Peter's head getting crushed between two locks, for instance. But I'd like to point out that these images were no more graphic than the things you might see on other adult cartoons. In addition, there has been blood and gore in the series before. Typically, it was just more spread out over the season. However, if you did feel that such imagery was out of place for the series, you were right. Editors cut nearly two hours of animated gore, violence, and sexual abuse from season 8, as well as rejected three proposed episodes featuring what you can see on screen right now. The last episode was eventually rethought and made as partial terms of endearment, but was cut from the air in the US, despite being shown in the UK and being available on the DVD for the season. I would like to point out the episode Dog Gone, in which Brian loses faith in his ability to write and accidentally hits and kills a dog with his car while drunk by crushing it in half. When he reveals this, everyone but Stewie laughs at him and mocks him, saying that no one cares. Stewie does mock him for a while, but when he realizes how serious Brian is about the issue, he stages Brian's death so that Brian can see the family mourn and feels vindicated. I suggest you watch the episode while keeping in mind that Seth often represents himself through Brian and Stewie. In this particular episode, I also believe the various dogs and their reactions to their environment reflect Seth's emotions. Early on, when I asked Seth about why he seemed to be emphasizing his use of Brian and Stewie, he just told me he was frustrated with the series so far, that he'd begun to feel like the earlier seasons were idiotic, that the fanbase were morons, and that he was stuck. His name would always be associated with Family Guy. He also told me that he was bringing in someone to help mature the material. He mentioned having worked briefly with the man before. The stressed, slightly mad tone of season 8 accumulates in Brian and Stewie, one of the most serious episodes of the entire series. There are no cutaways, and the deteriorated characters behave in a way that seems to show them in the most distilled forms. Again, this episode was heavily censored and altered. In the original script called for the scene in which Brian eats Stewie's stool to be shown, not just implied. Brian considers suicide because he feels his life has no purpose, and Stewie saves him with a friendship. Following this episode, the tone evens out and things return to more or less normal for the series. There is nothing particularly occult or metaphysical regarding the circumstances around the making of season 8. None of the writers or animators were insane. There were no mysterious deaths or possessions. None of that. 
for those of you looking for a tryst or reason, I will say this. While Seth usually seemed tired outside of working, he did his best to keep up appearances at major events and gatherings. However, it was said that he often looked sicker or more listless in the presence of his consultant, and was reluctant to say no to suggestions said consultant, whom I will call Steve, made. From what I've gathered, he didn't really start making suggestions during sessions until around episode 3, but was just talking to Seth in private about the series. He was silent for some time, almost absent aside from just staying in, and then began to converse more actively with Seth and the co-workers by the middle of the season. While those who had to deal with Steve did usually seem irritated or perturbed by his presence, he did have some connections. Drain Johnson's brief appearance in episode 10, Big Man on Hippo Campus, was attributed to Steve, and I was told Mr. Johnson, when jokingly asked by one of the crew on the set about how he was asked to do the scene, commented that he was only there because he owed a favor to Steve. He acted uncomfortable at the time, and even during filming the short. It was done in one take, and he was not asked to do it a second time. From what I heard, Steve was present and seemed pleased by the fact that Mr. Johnson was visibly uneasy. During one session, the second time I saw him in person, I did question Steve directly about a suggested plot, and when he turned to look at me, I was genuinely scared. I have no idea why. He had never once threatened, swore, or made a personally violent move. I suppose it was just a series of ideas regarding violence and gore he pitched to Seth. I should mention that when the others did protest suggested violence, Steve would typically switch to sexual themes, racism, mental illness, or just withdraw altogether until he could work in one of his themes again. The pitch I was concerned about was a writing gag. The question I asked was something along the lines of, I think that what we're doing may be a bit too much for one episode, but what is okay once, maybe twice in the episode, but showing the same man dying over and over might be a bit too much. The gag being pitched was that Pierre, at various points in the episode, runs over the same man, who despite being whole and alive every encounter, is increasingly mauled every instance, with a different reoccurring character running over and screaming that the man was dead. Seth was unaccompanied to the wine session for episode 17, and he was much more energetic than I had seen him in months. He was almost celebratory, and it showed. He picked up some of his favorite musical numbers from the series, cut or not for the end of the episode, the plot of which seemed to have been a symbol for his own self-redemption. I have been unable to track Steve down since to find out more about him, no records exist within the company to show that he was ever officially signed on or paid, and I believe he may have been privately hired by Seth. For what reason, I have no idea. I'm just glad to know he's gone.